Moving on, river right there, bottom of diamond. Let's look at urbanization as well. Diamond argued that states were influenced by particular materials. Let's look at urbanization. How is urbanization influenced by particular materials? And this actually, where is that? This it says Iwaoma's University, but we're not there right now. Um, I did this when, uh, this is my master's thesis. This is a summary of my master's thesis from the year 2000, so 10 years ago. This word, division of labor, is from Emil Durkheim, if you know any sociology. And Durkheim argued that humans specialize and work together and make a system of hierarchies that makes their life easier. I want to say, what about the materials that we use? Do some materials allow us to make a stronger hierarchy than others? And how would you, how would you test this idea? The longer title is, is too long. I chose this long title because we live in an internet world and all these are search categories. So, so people can search for lots of different things. What I did, how would I operationalize raw materials in the division of labor? I looked at mostly cotton and wool. Cotton is very minimal. You can expand cotton very easily as a fiber. Wool is on an animal. You cannot expand sheep very fast. If you do, they get sick, and the quality of wool goes down. So you, it's far more expensive. What about those material differences into textiles? This is really a critique of Marxism, too, because um, Karl Marx and Engels, they argue that the textile sector of England would be the future for every material, that everybody would have large-scale industry. But I show that it only happened in cotton. It didn't happen everywhere. In wool, in sheep wool, it remained decentralized. Why? Let's look at that. And this is all over the world. I look in England, uh, Europe, United States, Italy. I look in East Asia. This is a repeating factor in large-scale urbanization. I argue there's nothing called an abstract urbanization. We need to think of it as environmentally connected. There's no abstract proletarianization. There's a proletarianization that Karl Marx describes of capital versus labor. But I say it's capital versus labor in a particular material. We need to think about the environmental context of proletarianization. There's no abstract raw materials. There's specific physical qualities that we need to think about. There's no abstract technology. There's technology that is exclusively connected to a certain raw material. There is no you know, abstract politics. The politics is connected to a certain material, too. And I, I question the whole big idea, the meta narrative of industrialization, as something general, instead of raw material specific, mostly specific to cotton. So, how to analyze interactions empirically. If you look at urbanization, raw materials, uh, technology, social stratification, and all of these together, I argue that certain material matter. We'll ignore that for a minute. Uh, part one, the substrate set. The choices of materials. What are the choices of textiles? And I ask, why is cotton and wool so predominant? Part two, which I don't discuss here, but I try to show that these are causal factors. These do explain some aspects that no one had thought of before. Um, skip that. What I argue is that urbanization can be thought of as two things. Uh, what leads to urbanizing preferences? If you have a material that's more technologically amenable, you can make a lot of it. That's what it means. Some materials you can make a lot of, and some materials you cannot. And the materials you can make a lot of, you can transport them into central areas much more easily. You can do that with cotton. What are those characteristics of cotton? Or any materials? Lack of perishability. They do not rot. You can add lots of value-added manufacturing. It's just raw cotton. But if you uh, tie it together beautifully, you can sell that cotton as a sweater, as a rug, 
for thousands and thousands of dollars. So you get a lot of value-added labor. Uh, also, high density, transportable. Cotton can be compressed so much that people built buildings on it. <laughs> um, cotton does not rot. They find cotton in ships that sank in the ocean 200 years ago, and the cotton is okay. <laughs> So, some things don't rot, and I argue if they don't rot, you can put them together in big, big areas. So, think of the opposite. What leads to things that stay in rural areas, things that rot? You don't build a city on lettuce, on kinit. There's no city that manufactures kinit. You need a lot of area, and it rots very quickly. So, it doesn't make any sense to raise kinit in Myeongdong. For instance. They have less technological amenability. They're site specific. You can only raise that in certain kinds of soil. Different requirements for space. The physical characteristics, they're very perishable. Ruralizing things perish. They rot quickly. So you, if you try to bring it to the city, it rots before you get there. That's the main problem. So, Humans look at these materials and say, well, we're not going to build a city on Kimi or, 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 or Sesame Leaf. There's little value-added manufacturing. It's too bulky. It, it weighs too much. A good example here is cotton fiber and cotton seed. Cotton seed is very lightweight. And here's a, a map of this. Cotton, cotton seed, by the way, stays in rural areas and is pressed for oil. But it, it costs too much to transport it. So they build the factories in rural areas because it would rot. It, you can't transport it very fast. So expand the economies of scale for some materials here and other materials over there. Oh, I forgot I had that sound in there. Cotton Manchester is a city in northern England. Woolen Leeds is a city in northern England. It was a city based on wool and a city based on cotton. What is the history of them? Also, there's a city based on worsted. Worsted is a long fiber of wool. So these are two different kinds of wool, and this is cotton. This is what Karl Marx looked at in the history of industrialization, not leads. Leads remain decentralized. Worsted is a very long fiber, and it became very centralized. I argue these are the best cases of pure examples of textiles consolidation for cotton, wool, and worsted in English history. If the variations are here, they are anywhere. They're everywhere. Now that's a map of northern England. This is the ocean. Cotton from the entire world would come through Liverpool. And the first railroad was in Manchester. Why was the first railroad here? Because you had so much cotton. It was it was very expensive to build the first railroad. There's no, there's no technology for it. But it was so much money in cotton that they built the first railroad here, 1835, 1830 really. They built a canal exclusively for moving cotton because there's so much world cotton coming here. But five years later, they built the first railroad. There's still more cotton coming in. So cotton matters over here in Leeds. So this, you know, Wool from the entire world will come in through Hull. And Leeds is right here, and Bradford is right here. They just slowly moved it up the river. There was no pressure to move it quickly. There wasn't that much wool. Wool is too different. Wool does not have similar qualities. You had to separate wool in these different pieces. So I asked, why are these predominant? Why explain their use over other materials? And then we explore the variation of urbanization in those different materials. So here's the animal fibers. Goats, camels, yaks, many varieties of sheep. Wool, I argue, is unsubstitutable. There's a special quality of wool. Wool is not good for suppliers. Wool is very expensive. But despite that, you know, it doesn't have technological or geographic amenability. Wool can only be grown in certain areas. But it's expanded anyway. 
So people want to invest in wool even though you can't build a consolidated industry. You have to build it as a decentralized industry. So that's the issues of wool. It's unsubstitutable and other things. Vegetable areas, all the fibers that are vegetables, flax, K-pop seeds, rainy, rainy is East Asian, uh, cotton, and hemp is left out of this because it was not uh, connected at this time to large-scale textiles. Cotton is technologically minimal and geographically minimal. Cotton grows in 60 different countries. It grows in bright sunlight. It grows in less sunlight. It grows in areas with no rain. It grows in areas with lots of rain. So there's a lot more areas for cotton. And insects, of course, silk, very technologically minimal. Only one silkworm, but one long strand. I don't look at silk, but silk actually uh, is important too. The three ways we can think about this, we can compare all raw materials through degree of substitutability. Can you substitute wool? No, there's no other option. Can you substitute cotton? Sure. But you know, once you build the technology, the technology requires cotton involved. So you build technology that only manipulates cotton. And you build technology that only manipulates wool. Some materials are more amenable. Amenable means you can urbanize them very easily. And some are geographically amenable. You can make them everywhere around the world. And some you cannot, like wool. Wool you could not make in England when the population grows. You had to move wool to Australia and New Zealand. Here's a sheep. Um, different areas of the sheep. This is not amenable to a lot of technology. This is a different kind of wool than this. This is a different kind of wool than that. This is a different kind of... But if you take all wool off, guess what? You have to spend time getting the proper size. And what if it's a bad year? What if it's all bad wool one year? Well, you have to change your production. If you built machines, if you built machines that only use the best wool, you couldn't use those machines every year. So there's no incentive to consolidate. I don't have time, but this is the variety. There is no single wool. There's different kinds of wool. Here's another picture of a cute sheep. This is a, a world record sheep. You know, people have grown these sheep to, to uh, maximize the wool. This is the best, the fleece right here, right there on the top. It stays away from the dirt, but historically, you know, if, if there's too much rain, it may be bad wool. If there's too much sun, the wool may be stained yellow. So the climate every year changes. That's not the case for cotton. Cotton is always this long. It doesn't change. So we can predict cotton year after year. Um, let's skip that. Here are some examples of wool with low technological amenability. Here's some uh, wool here, all this is from the same sheep, or could be. There's many different ideas, many different kinds of wool. Low technological amenability. <coughs> the Champion Merino sheep from 1905. Lots of variety on this one sheep. 300 years ago, this is what happens in a factory. It's manual. There's no machinery. You get wool, and people look at it, and they separate it. This is an old picture, and this is a new picture. The same process. It has not changed. It has not changed for a long time. There's no reason to. Wool 